Okay, this works. Cool. So uh, that was a great presentation, by the way. I was I wish I knew that like two years ago when I started doing mobile app marketing. I learned a bunch of that stuff on the fly and as expensive lessons because I threw money at it really quickly. And as a marketer, I'm like, let's throw money at it. But I'm not here to talk about that. Today I'm going to talk about how to use growth as a content engine. And what I mean by growth is or content is content marketing, all the blogs, anything you produce, whether it's an image, a video, a product description, whatever it is, anything of that nature um, can be used for various parts of the funnel. Um, I run a marketing agency called Web Profits. Uh, I actually, this is my second agency, and two years ago I sold my agency. I was like, I'm never doing consulting again, and here I am. I actually found I loved it, I just needed a break, and I needed uh, a better structure. I also have a, another company called Rap Ventures, and Rap Ventures essentially uh, has and operates uh, five SaaS businesses, so we pretty much do the marketing for ourselves. So Mailshake is one of them, um, and we're very, very focused, as Tomas said, like on one feature, one thing, and doing it really, really well. We may not be the best at it, but every day, that's we're chipping away to be better and better. And I've, I've found features, requests, and all that things from customers, we just, we don't ignore them, but it, it's adding more actually hurts us more than anything else. So uh, a lot of what he said earlier can be applied to your product uh, and desktop as well as mobile. Mobile is just a lot harder to, to, to do because you have a lot less time. But anyways, uh, so I, I, I practice what I preach on Rap Ventures and it's a lot of fun. This is a, this is a sneak peek. This is actually my marketing funnel. This is, I, I took a whiteboard one day. I was like, what do I do? How am I marketing my web profits business? What am I doing to market my apps? Like, what am I doing to market? And I just kind of drew a funnel. I was like, okay, what am I doing? And I literally wrote down all the things I'm doing. I'm like, holy crap. All I do is content marketing. I don't really do anything else. And as Tomas said, like when you find that one channel that works for you, you get that hook, you get that bite on your hook, go double down, triple down, quadruple down. Uh, you might not be able to see this clearly, but we do a little bit of ads and, and things like that, but that's all supplementary to our, our main content engine. Uh, and I kind of listed out here in this example, like what's scalable, like things that anybody can do here, anybody ever can do, it's accessible to everybody like remarketing, creating videos, and then non-scalable things that uh, maybe I can do because I've worked myself into a situation, like I'm writing a book right now. Everybody can write a book, but it's like I have a public, like I, I got published, uh, or like uh, I work, I'm working with a publisher, and that's something that like I work my butt off to do, and I think like don't, you know, that's not something that's super scalable. Uh, you know, and co-marketing and speaking and things like that are kind of uh, a little bit more situational, so it's a bit tough, uh, but either way, uh, you know, it, it's kind of listed out. Uh, so, oops, here you go. So, uh, again, we use this engine for all of our businesses. So, whenIWork.com was a, uh, a company in the HR space that I was a part of. I was the head of marketing there. And before that, they were a client of mine. We built about a 5,000 tr new trials a month funnel using solely content marketing. And the last three, there are my properties, uh, over 100 leads each or 100 new customers just from content marketing. And that's because that's what we do. We focus, we double down on that. We don't try to find new acquisition channels. We try to milk and scale what works. Sorry for the flickering. At some point, uh, you'll see it. So my rule, the number one rule in content marketing, this is the thing I live by, is to win at content marketing, all you have to do is create something significantly better than your best competitor competition and your best competitor. That means all you have to do is one up the best person in the space. Maybe you'll be one up later on, but at that time you'll be winning. Uh, why I say this is because there's too many people, even though I've said this a hundred times, there's too many people that create top 10 articles or they create like, oh, my competitor did this. I should do this too. No, my competitor did this. It worked really well. I should figure out how I can one-up them or do something better than them. And that's how you win because they've already milked it. They can't, you can't really do it again. Uh, so this is how I think of content and how it fits in the marketing funnel. You can see there's, you know, top of the funnel. I kind of organize it really simply. Top of the funnel, you know, middle, think about like con the people are potentially buying your product uh, or thinking about buying it. They're in that flow of, of purchasing or consideration, and lastly, they've, they've purchased, or they're just about to purchase, or they're already customers, or just being customers. So I like to leverage content, and a lot of the same content for all different parts. So an example for top of the funnel would be 
co-marketing, right? So if you have another company that is targeting your audience with a brand, why not combine your efforts to market to each other's users or email lists and, and things like that? Because it, it actually helps you uh, because you become both become authorities. Um, to educate the market, epic content, things like eBooks, checklists, templates, and things that can help your users, your customers, potential customers, be better at their market, their job. Uh, guest posts. So if you're starting a blog, you're just starting with content marketing, you've got zero traffic, it's pretty hard to get your first 1,000, 10,000, 20,000 visitors. But if you blog on other people's sites, and yes, you kind of have to work your way up to do it, but if you focus on blogging on other people's sites, you can be in front of other people's audiences, which is much easier than trying to build your own audience, and sometimes um, that's the way to go. Content circles, which I'll talk about a lot more later, but, uh, and then in the middle of the funnel is influencers content. So what I mean by that is getting influencers to write for your blog, right? because it brings in trust and authority that they already have to your site. And sometimes that's easier than getting, your, getting an audience to trust you or trust you more. Videos, webinars, and again, co-marketing works the same exact way. We partner with HubSpot to create a content promotion checklist. Well, they're a content marketing machine. Why not? If we're selling content marketing services, we should be partnering with the best companies. So, uh, co-marketing works there as well. And behind the scenes, that, that, that whiteboard I showed you a few, um, a few slides ago, that's a behind the scenes. We actually share that, I created a video and whatnot. Um, customer stories, what I mean by this is actually success stories. And not even necessarily of your customers, it could just be success stories. So at Mailshake, um, we did stories of people doing cold email properly. And again, I'll get into that a little later asking your customers questions, this is the qualitative stuff, kind of turning, that actually for us turned into interviews and stories, conducting surveys, and again, all the same stuff you do at the top of the funnel. Send it, if you have a, a database of customers, send your best content to them. A lot of times people always focus on that, uh, that top of the funnel and they're just missing out on getting their customers to add value, making their customers smarter and whatnot. So I'm gonna talk to you today about 11 different tactics you can use. Uh, they can be applied anytime. They're not necessarily in any particular order, but these are the tactics I've used that have worked really, really well for me. First and foremost, before I jump into that, and uh, I want to give another warning. Please stop creating mediocre content. If you create the same content or a top 10 list or top 5 list and that's your content marketing strategy, it's never going to work for you that well. It might for a little bit, but it rarely works. And this is 2017. There's already too much content. Um, and I know there's lots of different languages and, and, and stuff like that in, the UK, uh, in Europe, but it doesn't matter. If you are not the absolute best piece of content out there, you're gonna get mediocre results and that's not gonna help you anymore. First and foremost is epic content. So epic content, what I mean by this is like 10x content, Rand Fishkin describes it as, uh, as something that's you know, 10 times better than what else is out there. And so essentially you're looking for gaps in the market or something maybe that's outdated. Brian Dean calls it the skyscraper technique. Doesn't matter what you call it. I call it epic content, just because I didn't want to use the same name as those guys. Uh, and what I mean by epic is just like slightly better than the best competitor. Uh, here's two examples. Mailshake, before we launched, we created an ebook. And our ebook was what we promoted the heck out of it. We did cold emails to our prospects. We our goal was to rank for email outreach and a miscellaneous amount of long tail keywords. And we did, and we did a lot of this before our product even launched. We did a lot of this because I was, our product was delayed and I was getting really antsy when my co-founder was building stuff. So I was like, screw you, I'm gonna start marketing this thing. Uh, and he's like, okay, fine, I'll throw up a uh, wait list page. So that's kind of the real story of that. And on the right hand side, uh, the, what we did for When I Work, you guys can't see that from here, but this thing drove 1.5 million visitors in 24 months. That's about 100,000 visitors a month, and it still drives 100,000 visitors a month because it ranks for team building games and, 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 and kind of a variety of those types of theme of keywords. Um, we chose that because there was a gap in that space. If you Google team building games uh, on a Google search, uh, a US Google search engine, you'll see uh, all the other competitors out there or four, five, six, seven year old pieces of content. And uh, ours is, it's not that it's amazing, it's like something to showcase. All it is is something that's a lot better 
than all the other crap that's out there. It's just newer, better, more uh, con concise, uh, more robust, and it looks prettier. That's it. That's all you have to do to win. Obviously, we did a lot of content promotion, which uh, I can't get into today, but um, we can kind of do it there in the Q&A, or um, you can kind of go to my site, sujanpatel.com, and download that checklist. Number two is content circles, and this is really, really important for everybody because no matter what industry you're in, um, it might be too niche, it might be too narrow, too specific, uh, or you might not be able to win in that space. And what I mean by content circles is topics that circle around your main industry. So that example of whenIwork.com, when I work is, it's in the technically HR space, but what it does is it's an employee scheduling tool. Uh, I think they call it like staff scheduling or like essentially it's for hourly workers who, you know, when they, it's to tell them when they're going to come in for the next day, like lots of restaurants, cafes, hotels, what have you, um, targeting a lot of small businesses. But if I talked about employee scheduling software and I created the best blog on there, I would have 50 visitors a month. That would never do anything for me. For growth, I would get fired, uh, the business would go under, none of that would, we want that to happen. So what we did was we figured out what are things that circle employee scheduling. So what is When I Work? It's an HR tool, so human resources. What does, wh what do people, who are our customers? Small businesses. What do they like reading about? Maybe productivity, management, culture, employee engagement. These are all things that are kind of relevant um, contextually to our main product. So we started winning and trying to go after those keywords because that productivity or talking about culture has 100, 200, 10,000 times the amount of search volume and interest than our main keyword and our main product. So think about your content circles and how you can come up with something a little bit more broader, right? So choose something that's a little bit broader than what you do and go after that because you can win there. And now when you combine epic content and content circles, that's when the magic happens. So there's three examples here. Um, I'll go with the best one in the middle. This is something we created on, it's called the ultimate guide. And I know there's a lot of ultimate guides out there, but I promise this is actually the ultimate guide. Um, the latest ultimate guide at least. So it's the ultimate guide to building your personal brand. And essentially, um, we did this for a hosting company. So hosting, if you put hosting in a content circle, eh, if we talked about hosting all day, we want to rank for web hosting, we would never get there. It's too competitive, at least for this small little hosting company that we work with. But personal branding, when you look at that, that's a lot more achievable. So what does personal branding and hosting have to do? Well, when you read the book or the guide, it says in order to build, the best way to build your personal brand is to have a blog, is to create content regularly. And what do you need to have a blog? a domain, and a hosting company. Uh, yeah, at least a hosting server. Uh, or if you can go with like a free account or whatever, but it says reasons not to do that and fork up like 50 bucks, 100 bucks a year or whatever. So this article by Brute Force, we drove Facebook ads. We promoted the heck out of it to other people. We used a skyscraper technique. People who have linked to or shared uh, similar content. And it got 50,000 views. But it converted like crazy because what did everyone do? They got super motivated. Not all, not all 50,000 people, but they got super motivated and they started a freaking blog. I don't think many people actually did much with it, but we got thousands of customers and those thousands of customers was pretty much like 100x the ROI or the amount of money they spent with us and more likely the ROI they would have gotten from if we were to go after the keyword web hosting because it would, took like, it would take four or five years to go after that and our competitors have like 10 times the budget. These two other examples are stuff we created for ourselves. On the right is web profits. We created something called the customer advocacy playbook. And on the right, on, on the other side, is the customer delight playbook. These are both around customer advocacy, kind of customer engagement and things like that. Why is that important? Our company, we target CMOs and VP of marketing. Those are the people that make, that purchase our products and our services. And so, Customer advocacy is something those people talk about in their meetings. That's something they think about in their day to day. Uh, and we just, we can win there because if you look at the results for customer advocacy, it's a, bu it's a bunch of software companies talking about how their software is so awesome. 
we're a neutral party, we can win at that instead of trying to win at growth hacking. Um, it's just too competitive, it's too saturated, or digital marketing, something more sustainable, but still too competitive, too saturated. Another thing you can do is take that best content from your blog, your epic content, and put it into your onboarding, into your nurturing campaign. So if you have a SaaS company, or even if you have e-commerce, what have you, put your content and send it to your customers. Send it to your customers as soon as they get started because it can help educate them. And I love educating my customers because one, financially, it improves the LTV, meaning it makes me more money. Um, it makes me, allows me to drive more traffic to, to buy more traffic essentially or spend more on content. But it makes them smarter. It helps reduce support tickets. It helps make happy customers. So that's what I focus on. And it's, you'd be surprised how simple it is to send your emails one of your top of the funnel articles. is just double dipping on stuff you already worked on to get more traffic. Number five is guest post plus SEO. So I remember I said um, before, I said, if you're just starting off, start by guest blogging. Well, find, every time I enter an industry, what I do is I find the top 50, top 100 blogs and bloggers, anyone who's writing content. And the blogs may be like large publishers. Now remember, like just because they're there, you identify them doesn't mean you can write for them. You probably, if you're just getting started, probably have to start at the bottom of that list and kind of work your way up. But you'd be surprised how easy it is to get your way up. And I have a few videos on it uh, on, on my YouTube channel, which you can kind of check out at the very end of the video, I mean, uh, the presentation. But, but essentially, find those top publications and find those top blogs and then do keyword research. Look at SEMrush, look at BuzzSumo, and find out what they're actually ranking for, what, what articles they're getting traffic for and essentially pitch them topics similar to that, right? Things that are really close to that because what will happen is if they already rank well or are already getting traffic for, let's just say, customer advocacy, well, it's not a stretch for them to get traffic on customer delight, which is very close to customer advocacy. So it just improves your chance of getting organic traffic. And frankly, if you do this right, um, you can get there much, much faster because, they, again, they already have a strong foothold. Now, just a full disclaimer here, just because you pitch them, just because you have, they have rank for a keyword, doesn't mean they're gonna accept your post. You still have to make a good pitch, you still have to be a good writer, it still has to be a good article, a good idea. So that's the challenging part, is coming up with a good idea that can actually meet these guidelines. You'll probably have a couple dozen opportunities total, so you use them wisely, but they do work. Like I said earlier, you can invite influencers to write for your site. There's a little blog called uh, by the company Kissmetrics. They get around, I think, about 500,000 visitors a month. ConversionXL.com, they have about 250,000 visitors a month. Both of them leverage this strategy. They didn't build their blogs and empires by writing themselves. Well, they do that a little bit, but most of the value came from other people writing on that site. Why this works really well is because Influencers already have a brand, they have a following. So for example, if you have a marketing blog and you invite me to blog on your site, cool, I'm gonna write something awesome and I'm gonna email my list. Even if my writing is not awesome, I'm gonna email my list and you're gonna get more traffic and your brand is gonna be exposed to my traffic. So uh, Kiss Metrics, I know, they kind of incentivize people to actually um, get more traffic, so they said it, they'll give you people a bonus if it reached more than 5,000 visitors each. So all these bloggers, all these influencers, like sure, we're gonna do that. And you know, they, I think it was like, you get double the amount of the article if you get double uh, 5,000 visitors or more. So they all just kind of did that because they want to double the traffic, or uh, sorry, double the revenue for that post. Um, create behind the scenes stuff. You think this is really, really kind of rudimentary, and it is, but like, uh, if you follow Taco Bell, I love Taco Bell, and might not apply here. I don't think they have Taco Bell here. Does, any, does there Taco? There's no Taco Bell. Huh? Uh, that's uh, that's what I was missing here. But uh, okay, so I love Taco Bell. Let's back up. I'm from the U.S. I'm Indian. I love eating spicy food, and Taco Bell is my go-to shitty food restaurant place uh, that when I'm really hungry. So uh, I follow them on Snapchat. I don't know how I got to follow them on Snapchat. I think it was one of the receipts waiting in the drive-thru. But anyways, I follow them on Snapchat, and they have this awesome Snapchat. that just They just share all these behind-the-scenes, like, secret recipes. All it is is just, like, this one guy on the marketing department in the kitchen of Taco Bell Corporate making tacos or tostadas or whatever, right? Mexican food is, like, the same five ingredients used in, like, 100 different ways. So, like, it was pretty creative how Taco Bell does this. Anyways, enough about Taco Bell. 
Here's how I do it. On the left-hand side uh, is an article, you can't see the title, it says, an inside look at Web Profit's growth team and, and team structure. And essentially, this is how we literally line out, and there's a video on it too, how we actually have our team structure. Why we did this, one, is that our, on our sales calls, yes, we listen to our co potential customers, people ask asking, like, hey, how's your team structure? How are you different than other people? Well, our team structure is actually how we're different because we actually are structured very similar to like an in-house marketing department more, rather than an agency. We don't have like account managers and whatnot, but I could say that on the call or I can share this article with them later and this is way more impactful than if I just blow it out because on the call, I'm a salesperson. On When I send them this link, they can see the social proof, they can see traffic, they can see the comments and whatnot. And on the right-hand side, I'm oh, sorry, the left-hand side, um, it's that 2017 marketing plan, that whiteboard I did. I literally did a video on like everything we're doing play by play. And I was like, screw it. I don't care if people copy what I'm doing. The hard part is not knowing what to do. The hard part is actually executing. It's spending the hours to write content. But this is how we win because people think, oh, wow, you're so good. You're actually sharing everything. Or at least that's the perception we're going for. And I'm hoping that, that we have. Um, interviewing customers is awesome because you can get one, product feedback. You can get you know, the stuff that Tomas was talking about earlier, the qualitative stuff. But you can also get really good stories about what they're doing. So at Mailshake, we actually interview all of our top customers. I have, like, the dashboard on the back end of, like, who sends the most cold emails and, like, the open rates. So anybody who has higher than 50% open rates and sends, like, a, the, the top 20 emails of the month, I ping and said, hey, like, can I just pick your brain on how you're using Mailshake? I, I started this actually as doing customer development and understanding my customers. What I learned is that's not that cool because everybody said the same features they wanted. What was actually cool was how they're using Mailshake and they're using it in different ways. Uh, and so I started sharing their stories. And once a month, I just publish a blog post. And again, it's, a, it's actually just a 30-minute conversation that we use. And so uh, again, it's really easy because our customers, we highlight them. And one thing we don't do is I showed here, it's, it's, this is not a customer like testimonial. This is not a customer case study. This is a success story on how people do cold emails. This guy is not a customer. Some of the people we interview initially were not customers and we still mix it up because my goal is not to say how awesome Mailshake is. My goal is to advocate how awesome and how many ways you can leverage cold email and how awesome cold email is. And by, if we have enough content, we start getting you know, ranking and, and plug there. By default, we become that awesome tool. We become the most awesome tool for how awesome cold email is. So that's kind of how we do it. Um, I also survey my customers and audiences and I ask them about their top problems, not about my product, about my service. I ask them what their top problems in life are, what their top problems in their job is. When we did this at whenIwork.com, we were interviewing our customers, small business owners. And what we found was, one, most of the small business owners were first-time business owners. Two, they had problems doing simple things like knowing what payroll provider to use, um, how to fire employees, how to make job description templates, these basic things that, I don't know, I would think are normal, the first time business owner were having really, really big problems for it. Um, and, and the biggest one is like how to fire employees. So we literally created an article on how to fire employees, like the right way, the legal way, and you know, and whatnot. But that little and then we sent it to our customers because that literally solved their problems. And if you solve their customers' problems, um, they're gonna love you. And we actually use um, NPS to uh, net promoter survey. Uh, or net promoter score, so we, it's a one to 10 uh, score of how much, how likely they would recommend you to a friend or family member or colleague. And uh, we started seeing the qualitative feedback in our NPS six months after solving our customers' problems. At first, it was all about like how much, you know, all the good reviews were like, hey, we love the product, it's easy to use, it saves me time, blah, blah, blah. Who cares, that was awesome. But um, after a while, we started seeing your content is awesome. Your, your guide helped me do this, or like it saved me time, it prevented a lawsuit. And that was, was like, wait, our app did not prevent a lawsuit. We don't do anything near that. And it was a content piece he was referring to because we got our customer support people to actually send um, um, emails to our, uh, our team, I mean, uh, to our customers. But I'll get into that in a second. Here's an example of, uh, of solving a customer's problems. 
that our customer persona, VP of marketing and CMOs, a year ago, they're like, oh, what's this, all this hoopla about Snapchat? I hear Taco Bell does a great job at this, but they're like, I don't know how to use this thing. Um, not that we do Snapchat, we don't do Snapchat as a service or do anything on that, but um, we wrote a whole guide on it, again, just to educate our customers, just to say, hey, like we're listening, we're trying to figure it out, um, here's the way we see a lot of other companies do it and whatnot. Um, and this doesn't just apply you know, to written content. Um, you shouldn't just take your best content or always be coming up with new ideas. My top traffic on every single one of my blogs, every single blog or site I've managed is never that bun's content. It's always content from the past. So what you wanna do with old content is repurpose it. Take your best stuff and turn it into different formats. Take your best videos, webinars, or articles and turn them into videos and webinars. Take your best articles or webinars and turn them into eBooks. Um, we did this um, with, with uh, an article we wrote on referral marketing. It did really, really well. This is one of our top performing articles of 2016. So we actually, at the end of the year, when we're analyzing this, we created a webinar. And why it works? Because one, people forget. Number two, um, people learn differently. Some people learn from a, an article some people learn in audible form, like I listen to audiobooks, I use Pocket, and I listen to the article, even though it's like in a shitty Siri voice, I listen to it rather than read it because I don't wanna spend more time on a computer. Some people learn by webinars. Uh, and at the end of the webinar, we kind of were like, hey, do you need help with marketing? And so we actually got some customers out of this. But ultimately, you could turn some of the best content into, um, into other formats and reuse it just as, and Quick, uh, like full disclaimer, my YouTube video is my best content, just repurposed in a different form, a little lighter way. I think it's a little funnier, at least for me it's funnier. Uh, all right, so my last tip here is teach your sales and support team to actually send customers content. So uh, I got ahead of myself a few slides ago, but what we actually do at when I worked at Comet, what we did was I sat down with the sales team and customer support team. I was like, guys, let's li let me listen in on your calls. Let me look at your chat logs and just see what, what's happening. What are people complaining about? What are people talking about? So when I talked to the sales team, um, I, you know, I kind of understood what their process was. And after every call, they followed up with an email. And the email was like, great talking to you, blah, blah, blah. We're pretty much trying to sell them, right? And I was like, okay, cool. Why don't you start sending content alongside your blah, blah, blah sales email to close them? And so they just took content from the top of the blog. And I was like, wait, hold on. Just don't take random stuff and the latest stuff. Take our best stuff. And so I just created a spreadsheet and I just added keywords. So I was like, hey, if your customer, if you had a call and they're like a restaurant, send them these, one of these five articles. If they're a coffee shop, send them one of these. If they're uh, an internet business, like we had also like on-demand service businesses using us, send them these, like how, how to do it this way and whatnot. Um, we did the same thing with our support team. That was a lot easier because we can actually look at the chat logs and tag clouds and keyword clouds, as at least we could with Zendesk. Um, and we just found out what people were talking about. And I just said, okay, if it's this keyword, use this article and it was super, super simple. And that's how actually we got the response in our NPS that um, people loved our content. It was from our sales team. And we got like um, people leaving. We are also, uh, when I worked at Com was also a mobile app. We got people leaving reviews saying, I love Sasha. She helped me a lot. And like, like that's Sasha's not an app, our, our app is when I work. Sasha was a salesperson that they talked to and they were leaving app store reviews with that. And they're small business owners, low tech, so I'll give them a little bit of that. But, but essentially, um, it's a really, really good way to get your customer support and sales team to just take the stuff on the blog and, and turn it into other stuff, uh, into making happy customers. And if you're really lazy, I know some of you are and I am as well, I use this app called Sixter. Um, and if you have a large team, you can essentially just control their email signatures. I know like our sales team, when we implemented it, they're like, uh, how do I do this and that? And it's like, ended up doing like technical support or IT support and I was really annoyed. But um, with Sixter and I have no affiliation, you can dynamically change the banner. And so it was an easy win. I said, okay, just put this plugin in. And essentially I would just change the banner to the piece of content we wanted to promote that month. That's it guys. And uh, follow me on YouTube to see all my repurposed content. I saw some uh, pretty great visuals on your uh, content and uh, we've been struggling a lot with that, creating like a 
machinery for doing good visuals. What's the, what is your best, like very low practical uh, ideas for creating the visuals part? So um, are you, so there's two ways I do it. I use tools, I use snappa.io or Canva. Uh, both of them have templates for blogs and social media. Essentially myself, I can go in and create a visual. So what I had is I hired people on Upwork. So this is for like, if you're a small team, you know, you're doing it yourself, go hire a designer on Upwork or whatever, get them to create a couple of different templates and then put those templates onto like templates that match your design style or your blog style or your website's, you know, colors. Um, and then just use those templates from Canva or Snappa so you can go and edit yourself. And what I, if I don't have a way to do it, and actually my blog is probably the worst example of that because I still use stock photography sometimes because um, I'm a little lazy, but for our other stuff uh, and clients, what I do is I just go into Snappa and I take an image that's a stock photo, I add a color blur, a color, like a, and then I blur it a little bit and I add some text on top. And there's, again, a bunch of templates or whatever um, you can do in like five minutes. But that, uh, that I agree to, and that's kind of where we are, but that's not epic content, that's just mediocre. Yeah, that's just, that's, like, that's okay content, right? So for epic content, you do, so all the stuff that we created on the, on the, on the epic content, those are all, uh, first of all, they're really long form content. We, some of them are blog posts that we then aggregated together. Uh, so we kind of like wrote blog posts that were like the table of contents to a larger book with the plan of if this goes well, we'll put it all together as one book. Um, and then uh, we got a designer, pretty much got infographic designer to take and make a really, really long infographic. And so that's what all of our content started with, uh, the 10X content. Um, and then we slice it up and turn it into HTML. The good thing though, is when you make it, so it is worth it and you have to choose the right keywords and whatnot to go after. Um, it does become worth it because one, you tackle a lot of long tail keywords and two, um, because of how, how uh, visually, how long the freaking things are, and how good they look, even if it's mediocre content, even if it's okay content, adding that visual layer makes it look epic. So, I, you know, you could get away with okay content, making it look epic. Obviously, people will tell. The other thing with that is, one, it's ungated. It could be used for top of the funnel. And lastly, um, you can get around 30 to 40% opt-in rate on that because it's such a large file to consume that essentially people won't consume all of it at once, so you can just save it as a PDF, uh, you can offer like a PDF version of it. Typically I get 30 to 45 across many industries. Yeah, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, I have a question about the ebook you have mentioned in the beginning. So you said it was um, downloaded um, around 1.5 million times? Uh, 1.5 million visitors. Ah, uh, visitors, okay. How many of them um, turned into a paid uh, into selling customers or at least followed the, the company? Yeah, so the conversion rate was really low on that because it was a part of the content circle. It's kind of far out. It was like 0.03%, mm -hmm. but on 100,000 visitors a month, it was pretty good. And then what we did was we tried, so at first we didn't have any opt-ins, and this is what, like, the further out you go and the less relevant you become, the, the worse your, uh, your opt-in rates are going to be. But um, instead of trying to get them as a customer immediately, because it was too far of a stretch, we put them on a drip campaign. And that drip campaign at the end sold them, got them to download some other content or whatnot. But it essentially, even the, comp, uh, the companies that would never ever purchase our software, it got them to see our other content and share it too. Mm -hmm. so, it, 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 what, it, so that high traffic, that content circle stuff, it does get a little bit less ROI, but if you're just getting started, it does give you a bigger footprint. So it's great for like the, awareness uh, stage. Very cool talk. Um, we're about to launch a web app in two weeks. It's about uh, a digital mortgage advisor and that will help mortgage owners finance the mortgage and save tons of money in the long term. One of the things I'm responsible for um, that I'm doing is creating content. And I'm faced with a, not, not a dilemma, but just a, qu um, a choice. Um, that is between long tail keyword articles um, around the 4,000 word mark um, as opposed to like shorter um, shareable um, blog posts that would li that I'd like to go viral. 
So here's my question, which one would you prefer as a way um, to build that initial traction? Um, I'm more of the opinion that I would probably want to invest in more foundational articles, yeah. like the content, the epic content, yeah. and then move on from there with yeah, shorter ones. So uh, that's a good example of a very, very, you said mortgage, right? Right. Very, very, uh, I guess, saturated competitive industry with a lot of content out there. Um, so you definitely need the foundational stuff, but you can't go like 100% in on the foundational. You still need some kind of uh, lighter, you need, well, not lighter, it needs to just to be more regular. And usually when you have to produce more frequently, it has to be kind of lighter for economics, right? Like you just won't, can't afford to create 10 foundational pieces a month or like uh, every two months. So I would create one or two or even just one foundational piece and um, a bit of like shorter form, like 1,500 to 3,000 word pieces of content that are published regularly. Uh, but put a lot more energy around the promotion of it. Um, so. Um, there's lots of different ways you can promote the content, but what you need to do is create a piece of content that is shareable. Um, that means you can call out different processes, companies, look into the skyscraper technique to see if there's any opportunities there. The thing that's hard about mortgage is that it's a pretty like competitive industry. People are pretty advanced in there, so you're dealing with like some really sharp marketers who've already like thought of what you're talk what you're about to think of. So don't feel bad if you're like oh somebody already did this, somebody already did this, but definitely question if you come up with all, if all your ideas are like oh no one did this it's either really bad or like um you're a genius <laughs> but uh likely there's going to be competitors and and you have to find the ones that are open yeah so one of the things we we're trying to we we're thinking about doing is like uh, infographics just like collecting not random facts but like collecting facts that you wouldn't otherwise read in articles yeah. and then making a sort of very visual infographic that's shareable is, is that a way to go at a beginning? Yeah, I or? think that's a good way, especially if you can get your own data. If you can turn data that hasn't been used. One of the things I did um, you know, about seven, eight years ago in the travel space, when I worked for a lead gen company in the travel space, we, we partnered with a publisher that had a lot of physical books, and we helped turn them into like online books. They, they weren't like, it wasn't form, formers or whatever, the, the big travel companies. It was just like these this small publisher who had like, 500 books, so we took that offline content, we turned it online. Even though it's been out there for 10 years, we just took it, transcribed it, uploaded it, and updated it a little bit, and it was unique. So if you can get unique data, survey studies, um, you could partner with, like, you could, you'd be surprised. Again, I don't know how it works in, in, in Europe or Germany, but um, when I did, when I looked, when I pinged, like, local government, like, city government bodies to get, like, local data, that was not like census or has been published before, they're pretty open to sharing it as long as it's like not sensitive data. So like for example, if you ask your local government like, hey, how many people have bought houses this year? Is it up or down compared to last year? We're just looking for more data points. We're doing this big survey. Um, they will likely answer. Now the way to get better answers is actually say like create the landing page and, and like almost like you already are about to launch this book but say we're conducting it, and when you ask for surveys and information, get show people the page that you're going to load it on. This will help your credibility go up, and your likelihood of like government, other parties, and schools, and like you can get government to help survey stuff. They're really slow, so kind of plan accordingly. But yeah, they, that that could work. Thank you. I would like to uh, uh, to ask you uh, how. Mm -hmm. Do you define the content circle? Like, do you consider by the keywords or by the topics? How do I find the what? One more time? The content circle when you write about something. Oh, like the content circles? Yeah. Um, Google. <laughs> okay, so here's how you find content circles. First of all, everybody should know like their top keywords, right? Like, they should know like the top three to five keywords that describes their service product idea, right? In your case, It'd be like mortgage, uh, it might be like, more, yeah, refinance, mortgage loans, car loans, whatever. Like that might be like a, a side kind of of that, but loans, there's all these like kind of themes, they're all the head terms. If you look on Google, Google's gonna tell you at the very bottom the suggested results. When you start typing, they're gonna give you like long tail versions of it. Now, you want those as well as kind of looking at like um, SEMrush or any keyword research tool to try to find other keywords that have high volume. 
Um, so you, essentially, the, the long story short is I look on, I do keyword research after I've done a couple, couple dozen Google searches to find different things I didn't think about. Um, and I'll put them all into, you know, essentially rank them all by the volume of keyword, uh, search volume that they have. Hi, so I've read an article that says that uh, for blogging you should have a steady routine. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, how often should we blog? That's a good question and I think um, this is something that I think a lot of people focus too much on that steady routine and consistency. Very, very important to be consistent, but if your content isn't the best, um, it's gonna be hard to get traction. So what I try to focus on is especially if you're just getting started, focus on getting one or two or three, like get the cadence going, but of good content, like make sure it drives traffic, make sure it works, and then get into consistency. What I found is when you increase the quality of content, it, you increase the difficulty, right? The time to produce it, the images required, the people required to use surveys and all that stuff. And again, you don't have to go that depth, but it takes longer. Um, but you want to make sure before you go do three of those or four of those or one of those a week, you make sure those work. And that's that right quality guideline. So what I do is when I get first started, I'll go create a really, you know, really light article. I'll create, you know, like a kind of a mid-level mid article or like in a really in-depth article. And I'll figure out like what is the thing that's sticking. Um, again, all of those ideas, I think they're going to be good. I've done my research and whatnot. And then I'll continue to cater. It's typically... Um, I've, I've actually done maybe two, three articles a month. So once every other week has worked well. Uh, it also depends on if you have an email list um, and how frequently you send them an email. But like, if you're sending people an email weekly go, and it's been six months, uh, or like let's just say you send an email weekly and you start switching from four articles a, a month to two, well go recycle some old content, and just update it a little bit. So you could still, publish four articles, but two of them are old stuff. In fact, when you update old articles, they generally will help you get more traffic from organic traffic, just because Google loves when you take old content that's, you know, has been there for a while, it's aged, and you update it. Even if you just do a little bit of like, even like a few sentences, it does it well. But yeah, I start with two as kind of your, your cadence, and then increase or decrease based off what works. Like, um, are you in the B2B or B2C space? B2C. What's your, can you just tell me real quick? So I work with, work with a tech company and we, uh, we have online data storage products. So my other question was actually, how do you uh, decide on the blog topics? You know, I'm, it's kind of difficult yeah, so for uh, me because I'm the only non-tech person in my company. Yeah. So I find it really hard. So, so yeah, that's a good one. So I have a client and, and it, they're in a really technical space like uh, around like um, securities and like preventing hacking and like all these technical things and like these acronyms, I have no clue what the hell they mean. Um, and I thought they were joking when they said some of these acronyms and they just kept going. Like I think they could say a whole sentence with all these acronyms if I don't know what the hell they are. Um, if you don't know what they are, chances are nobody does, right? So go first of all, do the keyword research. Then go on like sites like BuzzSumo or just start Googling um, those broad level keywords like SQL injection. Look at what's ranking on those things. Look at what's, what's actually there. Um, go on BuzzSumo and do the same thing. And when you're not looking for like a really imp comprehensive analysis, what you're trying to look for is like, what is too technical? Where is that bar? I find that most technical companies don't need to write technical content. They need to actually write content that bridges the gap from like a person like me who doesn't understand SQL, MySQL injection of whatever and how to fix it, right? So that middle ground is typically where it's at. And to convince them, you can just, you can, <laughs> you can ask people, like, go share the top content. And, you know, you'll usually find stuff that's kind of broader in general. It might go deep, but it might quote something or share an article that goes into much more detail. But generally, it's a little bit more broader. Thank you. Cool. Thanks to Jan. Awesome. Well, I think Thanks that's it. That wraps it up. Good luck on the lead.